Let's break down my latest client animation and learn how to manage an animation project specifically for a client. Tip -tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut. Today I'm going to show you the animation process behind a video I made for Broken Campfire, a video game discussion podcast. They were kind enough to allow me to use this project here on Tip Tut so that I can show you everything that goes into making a animation for a client. We'll take a look at the storyboards and style frames I put together, show you some tips and tricks on managing a project of this size, and then we'll take a breakdown look into what actually went into animating the project itself in Adobe Animate. So hopefully you'll enjoy this video, stick around for all of those tips and more as we take a deep dive into this client project. Okay, first let's take a look at the finished product to give us an idea of what we're working towards. You ever hear tell of the broken campfire? A group of knuckleheads sitting around talking about video games and other media. Word is, they got three save files, roasting over open flame, just rotating, rotating. <laughs> That's us. Broken Campfire. We're a uh, video game and other media discussion podcast and other media. Why don't you sit a spell and listen? So, the first step in any client project is an overlooked but important one, communication. You need to be able to communicate professionally, consistently and clearly to your client. This could be on the phone, via email or in any format you wish really, it will depend on the client. But you should always aim to be three things, consistent, clear and concise. Consistency. If you say you'll deliver something, do so, and on time. Set clear deadlines for both sides of the project. For example, the client failing to deliver their assets on time will impact the deadline, and the same goes for you, for your content as well. A later date, which you hit, is a thousand times better than a constantly delayed project. Clarity. Be clear in every aspect. State what your rates are, what their money is buying, perhaps with an itemized invoice, and what you'll deliver, and in what format. Also make sure to be clear on how much revision or changes they'll get within the budget. This is the big one for keeping things on time and on budget. So encourage your client to gather their feedback into an itemized list of changes. Concise. Share the information that the client needs and nothing else. Keep things simple and well organized. So when you finish a draft, watermark it, give it a version number and send that to the client. If there are changes, make them, increment the version number and so on. The first real step is the storyboard. With your client's brief in hand, build a sketched or wireframe storyboard that focuses on telling the story of the project. At this stage, you shouldn't be worried about specifics like color or fonts or anything like that. The storyboard should define the narrative. I like to also deliver a few style frames with the first storyboard, and these do focus on color, font, style, etc. Pick a few of the most dynamic and comprehensive shots from the storyboard and render them in the intended full style of your animation. This will help the client understand the final product without you putting hours of work in, which might then fall to the wayside. Present these to your client, remembering to be concise and clear in their delivery. Remind the client that this stage is the best stage for changes, as significant changes once animation begins take a lot of time, and therefore will probably cost them more money. Once the storyboard is signed off, you can get ahead to animating. I like to make a basic animatic of the entire animation, or at least the trickiest shots where I focus on blocking out the important camera, character and environment movement before then moving on to the detailed animation. This allows me to get the timing, spacing and other important story elements working before I focus on animating detail. For this project that was quite easy as I had a tight pre-recorded voiceover to go with. When working on a client project, the most important factor is flexibility. You will need to come back and make changes to the animation. It's inevitable. Therefore, I like to work as non-destructively as possible. Thankfully, Adobe Animate has a great workflow for this, which is symbols and nesting timelines. Let's take a look at the project to show you what I mean. Okay, so here we are inside of Adobe Animate and I've got two files open here, uh, the animatic version <clears throat> of our storyboard and the uh, finished version of our animation with uh, complete with character animation. So first I'm just going to take you through the setup uh, of the animatic using the first version of this um, animation here. And then after that, we will be going through the detailed version. So as you can see, I've broken this up into um, many layers. <clears throat> The first scene has a lot more layers here than uh, the second, purely because um, 
I could have reduced the amount of layers here by putting these all inside a single symbol. But instead, what I chose to do is keep them separate so that I could have some easier layer depth, thinking that I'd keep all of these shots in separate scenes. But in the end, I decided to have them all in the same scene. So as you can see here, I have um, all the different elements separated out into their own symbols, all in different layers with layer depth applied using the camera. And when you put these all into the correct place um, with the layer depth applied, which I'll show you using the layer depth window down here, um, you can correctly position the depth of these layers using the camera tool. So the camera is at layer depth zero. Um, some of these layers like the um, uh, cactuses, the trees in the foregrounds here and things like that, are behind the camera's zero point, which means that they are closer to the camera than the point of focus. And the rest of the layers are further away, so a larger number than zero, such as these mountains here, the sun, the clouds, etc. They are greater than the zero point of the camera, which means they're pushed into the distance. And you can see the camera here using this blue triangle. And what this does is, is it means I can just move the camera and everything else moves in tandem with it, which is quite simple. You'll also notice that these um, Cowboys here have a little bit of movement. And if I go inside the symbol of that cowboy, you'll notice it's just a little bit of simple arm and head movement. And that's pretty much the structure of the entire animation. If you actually go through and look, you'll notice, of course, that there is only a few layers here with barely any keyframes. Um, and that is because, uh, if I just zoom in here, see a bit easier. That is because whilst we do have some animation here, like on the bubbles, uh, which scale up and the camera that moves in and things like that. All of the animation for this entire project is done inside of symbols pretty much. So if I go inside this bubble symbol here, you can see that we have six bubbles that scale up and drop into place. And then inside each bubble, we will have a separate piece of looping animation, such as the sword moving here or on the zombie's head, for example, we've got the eyes moving, the drooling and the hands. Um, on this book here, we've got a bouncing up and down. And in this kind of cinema scene here, we've got the cape twirling, which again is inside another symbol. If I just unlock and go inside, there's another symbol inside, which has the wave animation on the cape. So you can see that already we're four layers deep and each of those layers will loop um, if, there, if it is on longest, if it is on screen for a longer time than the contents of the symbol. Um, <clears throat> so all this just done with camera movement. For example, when we zoom into the fire here, like so, normal camera movement, but inside the television, we have layers that fade up. Um, inside the save files, we have looping flames. We also have inside of there a burning on the individual save file with a looping bit of smoke. So you can see again, four layers deep just keeping all the animation as separate as possible so that by the time we move back up to the parent composition, all the animation is broken down into own individual components. So it's very easy to manage and change later on. For example, here we have the switching between different scenes. Okay. Um, we have this sci-fi uh, first person shooter scene. So the gun is on its own layer, which just goes back and forth. Then there's the bullet fragments, which are on their own layers up here. And then there is also the um, monster that he's shooting on its own layer. And again, only three layers deep here. Same with the sci-fi scene. Of course, we have the sky in the background and then the globe, which doesn't move, but we have the twinkling stars on their own layer so that they can just loop and twinkle. And the spaceship as well. Um, its movement path is in the parent symbol. And then the, uh, excuse me, I've got masks, so I just have to hide these. Inside that parent symbol, we've got the shooting of the lasers and the gentle undulation of the um, rocket boosters here. So again, four layers deep there. Now for the animatic, that's pretty much all that was done. Um, several layers deep, you'll notice that the only animation on the top layer here is the camera. But when we go inside one of our cowboy layers, you'll notice that I've separated out all of these elements onto their own layers here um, so that they can be edited individually. Later on, when we came to do the full um, animation, these were all parented correctly, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and also some of these inner layers here, like the hand, 
would have their own frames and the head would have its own frames um, so that I could choose positions using the frame picker tool. So let's take a look at that. Obviously, this is the final version of the animation. It's got an additional scene of uh, like a Dark Souls type game as well playing. And there's a bit more animation on the um, parent layer of the composition. And that's just things like this extra pair of hands coming in because it, was, it needed to react to this camera on the um, project rather than just reacting to um, the contained symbol. So again, all the same animation, all the same sort of stuff, but now you'll notice that the characters are talking. So that's really the only difference. And I'll do a little time lapse later on in this video of how I, uh, to show you how I kind of went inside and edited these. But just to show you, if I go inside this left cowboy here, you'll see that frame one of our cowboy starts at frame 105. And this is linked up. So if I go to, you know, frame 172, it would take me to frame 68 of the uh, cowboy in a symbol which is linked to the point where it comes in on the main timeline, which is so useful because now I can go inside and I can just animate my cowboy in a way that I want to in its own contained symbol. <clears throat> and you'll notice that each of these, um, each of these uh, layers here have their own um, tweening applied to them. So for example, the body here um, just wrap rocks back and forth and Everything else seems to move with it. And that is done because I've done layer parenting here. So you can see that I've got the body as the root of this. So anything that is attached to the body will move when the body moves. For example, if I rotate here now, you can see that the rest of the cowboy rotates with him. This allows me to add simple keyframes to a single layer, which can then rotate back and forth, scale, squash, stretch, etc., and it'll affect everything else. So I just start off with the body, rocking that back and forth, and then I'm like, okay, his arm should probably move a little bit, so his arm dips as well. Um, you'll notice his thumb um, tapping every now and then, as well as the head turning um, as well. Excuse me, that's my phone going off. Um, but all basic tweening stuff. The only things that are quite interesting here are the hand and the head turn. So let's talk about the head turn, because that's the simplest. you notice here we have some keyframes on the head layer. It's just rocking back and forth, but then at some point it turns. But if you look at it, it's actually the same symbol all the way through. I've just used a frame picker and inside that symbol, I've drawn a number of different frames. So if I go inside that symbol, you can see that I can flip back and forth between these frames as his head moves around. And then on the layer above it, I can just rotate and skew the head however I like. So you can see here that it's turning as it's lifting back into its original position. And that was done just by doing a normal keyframe tween from this position to this position, then going back over and using the frame picker tool to just to just select a symbol like so, choose the frame that I want to show and it will just change to that frame for that particular segment. Uh, and then all that means obviously is that you've got the original motion of the head tilting back and then you've got the frame picker of the head turning. Same thing for the hand as well. When the hand um, changes position later on, which I believe was about, if we go back to the previous block of animation, about here. So you can see that we have our hand raising off the controller, gesturing and coming back down again. Now, if you look at your hand layer, there's only three keyframes. Um, sorry, excuse me, uh, the hand back layer. There's only a few keyframes. This first initial position, this was the finishing mid position, and then it was back to the original position. And then I just went through and did the same frame picking using the individual frame layers that I drew inside there and just picked a bunch of different poses. So you'll notice this hand doesn't move, it just rotates. Okay. So all that movement is done on the tween above it, like so. And when you put it all together, it looks quite concise and quite good. Exactly the same thing happened here with this character. He was layer parented together. If we zoom out, we can see his entire animation timeline. You'll notice it's the same graphic for the first block of movement. So you can see he's moving um, in a similar way to this uh, first character here. And you'll notice that that brings us up to the point where we're, they're talking and the bubbles are moving between them. But then after the loading screen, it comes back to them and they've got a different block of animation where they turn towards the camera. And that's the same symbol, but just with a big pause where there's no animation because they're not on screen. There's a little bit of animation in this guy's thumb, but again, that's just because inside of here, I've just got this looping like so. So every now and then he taps the button, um, but you don't see it because at this point you're zoomed into the screen. 
when it comes back out of the screen, we've just got some more basic keyframes and then a final head turn as they look towards the camera. This cowboy does the same thing, a final head turn as he looks towards the camera. And I just made some layer notes, which I did by just going to the properties and typing in a label, which gave me a little bit of an example of where that head turn is going to be so that I can come into the main timeline, choose where I want the position to be, click inside and go, yep, I'm at the right place. Um, then the last final bit is just these extra hands coming in. That's just a completely static symbol, a few layers, no layer parenting, no animation, all done on the parent layer just by the hand sliding in like so and then zooming in to the campfire layer. And that's really all there is to it. So once the basic strokes are together, you could choose to send this animatic to the client to get sign off on the timing, narrative, etc. But this will depend entirely on the project. For this one, there was no need due to the entire animation being based on the finished voiceover, which was sent to me at the beginning of the project. So it's time to move on to the nitty gritty. There's no real trick to this part. You already know what to do. Make a cup of tea, knuckle down and draw some frames. If you get lonely, you could always live stream your progress with your client's permission, of course, every Friday, for example, between 2 and 5 p.m. GMT on youtube.com slash tiptop. But that's just an example. When animating for a client, even on the final steps, remember the cardinal rule, flexibility. You will have to come back and make some final changes. So do not animate in a way which is destructive or destroys your previous work. If it means that you have a library full of busy symbols because you've duplicated them to make safe copies, that's much better than having to come back and redo or undo work you've already finished because you didn't manage your project properly. So there you have it, a look into the not so glamorous life of an animator. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell. And if you've really enjoyed some of the um, videos I've been putting out recently, you can consider joining the Tip Tut Zone for exclusive perks such as discounts on merchandise, access to the Discord, shout outs and videos and personal design feedback by clicking the join button below and becoming a member of the Tip Tut Zone. Thank you very much, everybody, and I'll see you next time. I'd like to take this moment to thank my level two and above members, Unknown Ghost. WN62, Anonymous, Mel M. Hoover, Maybe Sharma, Ralika M, Mun336, Ian Costello, Deshant Singe, and Devunch Goel. Thank you very much. You're making it a very Merry Christmas here at Tip Top. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks, and tutorials. Thanks for watching.